In today's episode, I talk about practicing handwriting, using an ultrasonic cleaner, and good and bad pen habits. Hey there, Brian Goulet here of GouletPens.com, and this is episode number 173 of Goulet q and I hope you've had a good last week or so. I know I have uh, been very busy, had a lot of stuff going on in my personal life, had my daughter, had her preschool graduation last week, which I alluded to, and it was adorable. She said when she grew up that she wants to be a mommy, and that really made Rachel's day. Um, so that was pretty cool. We didn't know what was gonna come out when, because all the kids did it, and some kids wanted to be like ninjas, and others wanted to be like dog groomers, and all kinds of cool and interesting things. So that was kind of neat. Um, let's see here, we also, so uh, this is a bit of a downer, but um, you know, today, as of when I'm recording this, this is a couple days ago as of when it's published now, um, but Rachel and I had the anniversary of our miscarriage when we lost our child last year. So huge bummer. I've been really <laughs> feeling some feelings today. Um, I published you know, a blog post and, and just kind of had to get my feelings out. So I divulged more into that. But, um, you know, just to give you a little bit of context there, um, the day that I found out that Rachel went to the doctor and we found out we lost our child, I was actually traveling to go and get some nib training from a respected nibmeister. Um, so I get asked all the time about new nib training and stuff like that. And uh, that I was on my way to do that. It took me several years to kind of set that meeting up. And uh, as it so happens, I get that call literally as I'm on my way to the training. So I canceled the training, came right home. Best decision I ever made. However, that just added to the, to the emotions of that experience. And then of course, after that, Rachel had all kinds of health issues, which resulted in a hysterectomy for her. And so now we can no longer have children in our natural form. Um, of course, we can always adopt and we can always foster and, and do things like that. Um, and we're, we're open to that if we feel called to do so. But um, you know, that was a very, so that happened in, in October. So that was just, adding to the roller coaster that happened last year. And this is the first time that we've shared publicly um, with you all that that was to the extent of what we went through. And then of course, after Rachel had the surgery, it woke up uh, some mono, like she had mono when she was 16. It woke that back up in her body. And so she got mono right after the surgery. This was in November at this point. And we were going to doctor's appointments and trying to figure out what in the heck was going on with her. Um, eventually, she found a really good doctor and got on this really strict diet and supplement regimen. So basically starved the mono and she had candida and other things going on in her body. But just last week, we went to a doctor and uh, back to the doctor and she's basically got all that stuff cleared up out of her system and is kind of getting back to normal now. She lost 25 pounds in the last six months. Uh, and so it's just been an amazing ride for us in the last year. Very emotional experience for us and it's all just kind of like, washing over me today. So, um, you know, if I, if I went on a little bit too much, I apologize, but that's just, that's what's been going on. And, and, uh, you know, it's been really kind of an emotional thing for us, but, um, that gives you a little insight into kind of all that we have going on. We did share publicly about the miscarriage last year, but we did not share publicly about her surgery and, you know, going from within a few month period to, okay, we're gonna have three kids and now, okay, we all have two and we're not gonna have any more. So a very emotional experience. And then of course all the health stuff on top of that. So it's been a wild ride, but anyway, feeling some closure, like for me publishing that and kind of telling you guys, uh, it helps me um, to, I guess, give some meaning to it all and just to have it be less taboo, you know, cause that kind of stuff people just don't really talk about, but it affects a lot of people. So just if I can, if for nothing else, just be an example to you to let you know that it's okay to grieve. It's okay to just be really bummed out when stuff like that happens. Cause it's a really just sucky experience. And I can say that now firsthand, but you can get through it and there's hope. And, um, you know, with uh, the right support and right people, it can, it can make it um, actually, you know, stronger in the end, you know, your relationships that you have. So, um, you know, one thing I will give as a little piece of advice, I'd, I had never had anybody that I knew personally openly that had gone through that experience. So I didn't even know what to like say to get help during that time. But the thing that I found the most helpful was for people to just say, I'm really sorry. I'm here if there's anything I can do for you. 
and just that's it. Like in me, I'm a doer, so like I always wanna be like, how can I fix this? There's just no fixing a situation like that. So even just saying like, hey, I'm here if you need me. Like that in those moments, especially when it first happened, was so comforting to me and to Rachel. So if you are ever experiencing that or going through a situation where somebody else is going through that and you are trying to encourage and support them, just say that and it can help. All right, that was pretty deep. Whew. Let's lighten it up a little bit here for the rest of Q&A. Um, so, Yes, this is crazy, and there's all kinds of crazy things going on in the world, too, recently, which I'm only recently discovering because I've been in meetings all day. But, um, you know, uh, there's just crazy stuff that goes on sometimes, but that's all right. We're here to talk about pens. So um, my kids are finishing up school this week, so that's kind of fun. They're going to be excited about their summertime and not having homework and stuff like that. Um, I did see a really cool video from Peter Draws on YouTube. Um, amazing artist, does some really cool stuff. Um, so uh, we gave him a Twisby Eco and a Jerobon Emerald of Shavor. And uh, I got to see what he did with it, and it was pretty cool. So I encourage you to go check that out if you haven't seen it already. And check out a lot of his other videos. It's really, really cool. Um, let's see here. Twisby All Turquoise <laughs> came and went. We knew it was going to be. We didn't hype it up a lot because demand was going to be really hot, and it was gone in a couple of hours. Uh, all nib sizes, so it's not even on our site anymore. Um, I don't know if we're going to get any more. So it's we took it off the site because we didn't want you to be all thinking that we were going to get more. And then if we didn't ever, that's it. But um, if we do get any more, just keep an eye on our site. Um, we're not going to highly publicize it because because demand is so high that we don't want to, um, you know, really spread the spread the um, the word too much. It's really just those of you who are like really into it can see it. So keep an eye on our site just in case it happens to come back. Um, we finally got the Aurora Duo carts launched. So we've had some stuff, you know, just uh, inconsistencies and stuff and some of the packaging and stuff that we wanted to kind of straighten out. Um, but now we've got those all uh, straightened out and so you can uh, check those out on our site. Um, so those are pretty cool. I've been playing around with that and we'll have a video coming out on that pretty soon. And then um, the Aurora Black Demo, which is not a new, but it's a new to us. Um, we're still waiting on the fine nib on that one, so we don't have that, but we have some other nib sizes, so you can check that one out. Um, you also notice on our site we have some Nemesign inks. So this is Nemesign the pen brand. It's coming out with some inks, which are really pretty cool. And dang it, I wish I'd grab the bottle. I don't have a bottle, but you can check it on our site. It looks kind of like the Arosha Zuku Mini uh, bottles, except it's a little bit bigger. Um, but it's very cool. Nice, sturdy bottle and pretty good price um, and some pretty cool colors. So I'm actually kind of excited about that. So I think we're going to be like one of the first ones to have it. So you can go and check that out. We'll have samples and everything of that too. Um, also, we have some other things like, you know, expanding our diamine ink cartridges. Um, those will be coming fairly soon. We have some Faber-Castell Guilloche um, pens. So those are the gold nib Faber-Castell. So there's, you know, the, the graph of on Faber Castell. Um, you can check those out. We have um, like the turquoise and the uh, orange so far, and the pink one is coming. Uh, so we'll have that one fairly soon. Uh, and then we should have the Lutrum some lines a day pretty soon as well. We're still waiting on uh, getting stocked on those. But uh, And there's other new products that are coming down the pike, lots of new stuff that will be coming, but that's all I'm going to talk about today. All right, let's get into the questions for this week, shall we? So starting out with some pen and writing questions, this is from Evan C. on Facebook. I just got started in writing with fountain pens. What is a good habit to have and what is a bad habit to have? Okay, so I could go on and on about all this kind of stuff, but you specifically asked me for one good and one bad, so that's actually what I'm gonna stick with. Okay, well first off, Evan, welcome to the pen world. That's awesome, check out the Fountain Pen 101 series if you haven't already. Of course, watching good videos is always a good habit, but that's not my official good habit. So um, I think the most important good habit to get into is probably to keep a regular pen cleaning maintenance uh, underway. So, I mean, some people almost never clean their pens and never seem to have a problem with it, but I think that so many people don't realize that, you know, fountain pens need a little bit of maintenance, need a little bit of love to remain operating optimally, especially if you're cleaning it out in between colors. You wanna flush it out and clean it out properly. That is going to keep your fountain pen experience really positive and it's gonna be a great habit to get into. If you do nothing else, just keeping your pens regularly clean and maintained is gonna be the best habit that you can have. So that is my official good habit that I recommend for you. And then the bad habit, I think, there's a lot of bad habits you can have with your pens, but I think the worst one that you can have, and this is commonly, I'm, I'm keeping this in mind of like, you're just coming over into fountain pens. I think the thing that most people don't realize is that fountain pens use a liquid ink, which flows great. However, 
it will dry out in the pen if you leave it sitting out. So the bad habit would be to leave your pen sitting out uncapped for a long time. And the reason I vote for that one as the worst bad habit is because that can lead to a lot of other problems. Because what happens is, a lot of times I see this as people that leave it uncapped for a long time. They don't even think about it. You know, they're just used to uncapping a rollerball, leaving it out, do whatever, talking, you know, just sitting it out. And then they go to pick it up and it's not writing properly. So then they end up pressing too hard and, you know, splaying the time tines and then it feels scratchy, it doesn't write well, and then they're like, oh, my pen is all screwed up, when really it had just dried out a little bit. And if you had capped that pen real quick, you would have saved yourself from all of that. So that's the worst bad habit I see is leaving it uncapped, especially because then it's like if the pen rolls off the desk, then it can fall on the nib and ruin the pen and all that. So having a pen uncapped too long can be a really bad habit to have. And then the good habit is keeping it regularly cleaned. So that is my answer for your question, Evan. I'd love to see if anybody else has any feedback, so you can go ahead and leave your thoughts in there. That's not my question of the week. Oh, I didn't come up with a question of the week. Well, I'll make one up by the time I get to the end of the broadcast here. <laughs> Next question is from Bryce G on YouTube and Mel the Maker on Instagram. I kind of merged two questions together on this one because you guys over overlapped quite a bit on this. So here goes. Teamwork makes the dream work for you guys here today. Um, I was wondering if there was a sort of case I could purchase to store ink bottles on the go as every pen case I seem to find doesn't have the room for ink. If not, any tips for storing ink would be helpful. And then Mel came in and said, what about cleaning supplies? So you both were talking about traveling with your pen supplies, right? Not just the pens. So um, I grabbed a few different cases of things that I have so that I could show you kind of what uh, techniques I have used successfully. First thing is, if you're gonna be traveling, I lately, if I've been doing just a, like a, a day trip or a couple day trip, I really don't bring a lot of bottles of ink with me. I bring just inked up pens. So I'll bring a pen that has a lot of ink in it, I'll just cap it off, or maybe use a piston filling pen or something that has a pretty high ink capacity or vacuum seal pen, um, and I'll just bring that. And then I don't have to worry about carrying around ink bottles. Because really, if you're carrying a whole bottle of ink, that's like a year's worth of ink in most cases. So that's really overkill unless you're gonna be traveling for a long period of time, which is fine. And then you can just pack it in your carry-on or whatever, pack it in your, your not carry on, the opposite of that. Check bag. There we go, assuming you're flying. But anyway, so um, the thing I'll say about pen cases with ink bottles is they're really not made to accommodate ink bottles. I don't really know of any case that is made to accommodate like full size ink bottles. I'm talking like, you know, a bottle of diamine or something. Like, it's a big chunky thing, unless you're bringing a, you know, like a duffel bag. This is not gonna be super convenient to carry it, so I think you're gonna probably wanna lean towards finding an alternate solution, or you're gonna to need to be looking somewhere outside of just the fountain pen world, right? Because you're talking about carrying around a large object at this point. And really the only cases that I have and the only cases that I've really seen specifically in the pen world is related to carrying just pens. So I'll give you some options here. You know, obviously you could find some kind of hard case or soft bag or something, I don't know, cosmetic bag maybe or something, I don't know, for something for the, the full bottles of ink. Um, but some of the other things that I've seen that have worked really well in a regular pen case is ink sample vials. So I do have those not just in the regular ink samples, but you can buy empty vials. So if you want, you know, it's got a seven mil capacity. If you fill it up all the way, um, you can actually take it and you can tuck it away into your pen case, you know, because it's about the thickness of a pen, uh, maybe a little bit thicker overall, but it can tuck nicely in there. You can double them up if you have, you know, kind of a doubled up layer like this. And that can work really well. Seven milliliters of ink is really a lot of ink. So if you're traveling somewhere, even for a week or two, you can probably just have a couple of these and be generally okay. Um, there's other things that you can do, like I have the Visconti Traveling Inkwell. So this is, you know, kind of more pen shaped too. And it's, again, this one is made to fit inside. I got a Visconti pen case here. This is an Aston one, which I'm out of a stock of a lot of these Aston ones uh, right at this moment, but uh, they were switching tanneries right now and we should have them restocked here fairly soon. But um, so, you know, if you have the traveling inkwell, it's really cool. I have a full video on the traveling inkwell if you want to just kind of Google that and check it out. Um, but you can fill your pen directly from uh, the inkwell here. So that's pretty convenient. And um, it holds about six milliliters of ink. So believe it or not, even though it's larger, it holds less uh, ink actually than this one does, but go figure. 
Um, that is another option. Um, the Twisby uh, VAC 20A ink bottle is pretty decent. You know, it seals up okay. I haven't uh, traveled a lot with this one myself personally, so I don't know how it holds up in terms of like rough and tumble, but it's just, it's a little smaller than say some of the larger bottles of ink, so this one might work. You, yes, of course, if you have a Twisby, you can fill it and do some cool vacuum things in here with it, but um, otherwise you can just open up the thing and just carry it like that. So that might be another option for you. Or, um, you know, there's a couple of brands that have smaller bottles, like Diamine has 30 mil bottles that are made of plastic. I've definitely had times where I've been a little rushed and I'm like, oh, let me just grab one of these and I'll throw it in my bag and then I'll go. And you know, it's a 30 mil bottle, so it's a full ounce of ink. And if you're flying, um, you can fly in, I don't know if it's everywhere in the world, but at least in the US here at the moment, I think it's an ounce that you can bring with you in a carry-on, so you won't get in trouble if you have this. If you get much bigger, you know, for example, I have like the Robert Oster, this is like 1.7 ounces or somewhere thereabouts, so it's not quite as kosher to bring that with you on a flight, but um, it's also plastic. So this could be another option if you want to bring it in your check bag or something. It's a little durable, it's not as careful as glass. Um, also, there's um, Nalgene makes a um, hard plastic bottle that's you know similar in kind of sh size to to these ones. Um, but it's a one ounce bottle, so you could bring ink in that. I've heard of people using that. I don't have one, um, but I've heard that they work pretty well for when you're traveling with you know, and you want a full bottle of ink with you. Um, and then those things can work nicely. Some other pen cases that I have here are New Knock. So I've got the Knock Brass Town here, which has the you know bleh, the big tongue that kind of rolls out of there. Uh, of course, you can put pens and stuff in here, and you could put your traveling ink well, or you put what your ink files or whatever into the actual pen portion of it. But there's also this big open kind of pocket area where even if you have this thing filled with pens, there's plenty of room in here to be able to carry extra stuff. So you could easily tuck, you know, a 30 mil bottle of diamine or something in here with your pens and you could still kind of take it with you. So that might be another option for you to consider if you're shopping cases. Um, and then the other knock one that I have here, um, you can also do the same kind of thing. So you can, it's got a little notebook sleeve, it's got a pen holder, um, and you can take and you can shove ink sample vials, you know, in between here, in the bottom, whatever. Um, you got some options there. There's a little extra room inside these cases so you can make that happen. Um, and then uh, as far as cleaning supplies go, Mel, you asked, um, so the only cleaning supplies that I really, I don't usually travel with a lot of cleaning supplies. I'll just use whatever the converter or whatever that's supplied with the pen. Yes, it's a lot more convenient to use something like a bulb syringe. But if I'm traveling somewhere, I'm usually not changing ink colors and doing all that kind of stuff. So I've usually cleaned my pens and freshly filled them before I travel. So I'm not dealing with, um, you know, the same degree of, you know, uh, needing to maintain my pens. But again, I've never really traveled personally anywhere for like a long period of time. So that just might be something to consider. Um, a bulb syringe, fitting that in there somewhere, but it squishes down. And if you had to stick this inside a, a you know, a bigger case like the knock one, you probably could, but otherwise you might just have to check it. And then other things that might be handy is say an ink syringe, but that's kind of pen shaped. So that could take up a slot in your pen case if you have any of those. And Silicone grease too is not a bad thing to have. It's again, it's probably not one of the most essential things to travel with unless it's for a long period of time, but that's relatively small. Like that could tuck away into a portion, especially if you're, you know, um, trying to fit it in with, uh, you know, an ink syringe or something. You could probably, well, not, not in the Visconti one, but you could easily fit it into your Aston or into your, um, your knock one, especially if you had to kind of like stick it with here and you know, whatever, you can make that work. So that's kind of the advice that I have for you today as far as the cases and the traveling with stuff. Um, hopefully that helps you out somewhat. Cool? All right, let's talk about this next question from the Viking on Instagram. What are your thoughts on the use of ultrasonic cleaners for fountain pens? Especially, can they have any negative side effects on fountain pen materials? Do they affect piston or vacuum mechanisms, destroy finish, remove nib planings? Thanks for sharing your knowledge and experience. All right, you got like a five for one in here with all these questions. So I have a little ultrasonic cleaner here. Well, little, this is the bigger ones. A beautiful Chicago electric one. So they got this from Harbor Freight. Um, they have a couple of different ones there and you may have seen some of them or may have one yourself. So this is the bigger one, um, which I invested in a number of years ago and we use it here at my team now. We have one kind of for the office that we all share. Um, the first thing I'll say about ultrasonic cleaners is 
I really hardly ever use one personally um, because I just don't really need to. The best use for ultrasonic cleaners is when you have ink that's really dried up and like crusted up inside a pen. Specifically if you have vintage pens or anything that you're trying to restore and like you have no idea how long it's been in there but it's like there's like parts that are sealed shut and you like you can't remove the nib because it's so crusted up in there. That's where an ultrasonic cleaner can really help. You basically you just kind of fill the tub with water and you turn the thing on and it just vibrates ultrasonically. And it just gets the water into all those places and breaks down stuff a little quicker than it would just plain soaking in water. So that's where it's really helpful. And you can actually use like a pen flush solution in here too. That gets a little pricey if you're buying it, but if you can, you know, make up your own solution, that's that's legit too. Or you could just pour like a little bit of water and dish soap in there. That can get a little further along than just plain water, but um, that can help if you're trying to soak it as well. So um, as far as whether or not it's going to hurt your pens, I personally have never heard of anybody that's had horror stories of their pens being destroyed by an ultrasonic cleaner, as long as you are following the general rules of soaking pens in water, right? So like if you are soaking your pens in some kind of homemade solution, you want to make sure that whatever chemicals that you're using are compatible with whatever materials you're using. So there's general rules like that, but that the ultrasonic cleaner is not really doing that to anything. For example, you don't want to mix ammonia and bleach in here because that would be a toxic uh, gas and you don't want to do that. That doesn't have anything to do with an ultrasonic cleaner, but if you're like, oh, ammonia could clean things and so could bleach, let me mix them together. That would be a bad idea. But I wouldn't blame that on the ultrasonic cleaner. Um, same kind of things like if you're using, um, you know, an ammonia solution and you have an aluminum pen and you're trying to soak it. The ammonia, you know, can uh, uh, corrode aluminum, so you wouldn't want to do that. But as long as you're following the basic rules of chemistry and physics and stuff like that, there's nothing that I'm aware of, and correct me if I'm wrong, but there's nothing that I'm aware of that an ultrasonic cleaner will cause any harm to anything. Um, the, I think that's the reason why it's generally used is because it's a pretty safe method uh, of cleaning. Um, I know a lot of people that do vintage pen restoration and pen repair and stuff like that, and they'll use ultrasonic cleaners on really old vintage stuff. Um, now, <laughs> if you've got like parts that are all crusted together and you put in the ultrasonic cleaner and the pen like kind of falls apart because the crustiness was the only thing holding the pen together, that's kind of a different story <laughs> than it's really just you're dealing with the, uh, the after effects of what's happened to the pen, not necessarily the ultrasonic cleaner has caused that harm, it's really just more revealing the harm that has already been caused to it. So um, I think that it's something that, you know, if you really do a lot of pen restoration or if you have terrible cleaning habits and you just really like to get your pens crusty before you clean them, it might be worth an investment into an ultrasonic cleaner, but by all means you do not have to uh, use or, or, or worry about an ultrasonic cleaner unless you're doing a lot of deep cleaning on pens. Um, even me being as deep in the fountain pen world as I am, I almost never use this thing. Uh, my team will every now and then, but uh, it's really not so bad. And then as far as the actual using of the thing, will it cause uh, any kind of weird stuff? The only things that I've experienced is if you have, you know, a pen that has like a demonstrator pen and it has an ink seal, sometimes, you know, for a converter or something like that, ink or the, or the water can kind of work its way behind the seal just because of the ultrasonic, it'll like really work into all these random places. So you may have parts of the pen where water wouldn't normally get into it that would if you were submerging it in water and using an ultrasonic cleaner. So you just may have some of that going on long term. Is that going to have any harmful effects? I don't think so. Um, you just may end up seeing water ending up in places. Or for example, if you have a pen that has a cap that has an inner seal that uh, is, you can, it's clear on the cap and you can see the inner seal. If you have ink behind there, if you put an ultrasonic cleaner, it may just kind of spread it around more. It might not clean it all the way out. So there's things like that. It's not causing any harm. It's more of an aesthetic thing, but you may run into some of that. Cool. Right, this question is from the Bowtie Guy on Instagram. When you, Rachel, and the rest of the team first got into fountain pens, did you find yourselves practicing your handwriting? Both my best friend, who got me into fountain pens, and I occasionally find ourselves just practicing the alphabet to get specific letters to look just right. I was wondering if we were alone in this or not. Love what you and the crew do. Please keep up the phenomenal work. Well, thank you. Um, no, I think this is this is most definitely not unusual. Uh, I think it's very normal, in fact, especially for people that you know have never used fountain pens and they kind of discover them for the first time. Um, I personally, when I discovered fountain pens, I was 25, and I 
I'd written cursive in third grade and quickly abandoned it and never used it again until literally the first day I started using fountain pens. And I, I felt a compulsion to write longhand again when I literally had not done so in probably 15 years. So I uh, felt the need to pursue that. And I couldn't even remember how to write some of the letters. <laughs> so I literally like went on Google and was like, the, I was thinking about the like, what did I use in elementary school? Like I had the sheets that had the all the letters on it with the little arrows that told you which way to go as you write the letter. And I pulled that up and I was like, how do you do an uppercase Q again? I was like, it looks like a number two. Oh, that's right. I remember that. And I just used that and I would just kind of practice. Now, I didn't get like super crazy into it myself. I didn't have practice sheets and practice the same letters over and over and over again. That is not uncommon at all. I mean, part of that was I had a new baby and I was growing a business and I just, I didn't have time to do anything. So I wasn't practicing my handwriting just because I didn't, you know, have time. Um, but that still said, um, I did intentionally practice my penmanship as I was writing out normal, you know, kind of everyday things. I was much more intentional about it and I immediately felt the need to switch to cursive and improve my handwriting as a result of using a fountain pen. So that is not unusual at all. I know that happens a lot and I know a lot of people who really kind of do fall in love with handwriting uh, itself and just penmanship in general through fountain pens um, very quickly go to you know, exploring things like cursive logic books that we have or other means of practicing. There's got a lot of good practicing books out there um, that you can get into specific, you know, scripts if you want, Spencerian and Copperplate and things like that. Um, there's a lot, it's a huge following on Instagram around hand lettering and hand, you know, lettering art and stuff like that, um, where you can see people have all kinds of printables that they've done and bloggers have come up with different things that you can practice handwriting. It's pretty cool. There's Skillshare classes on it. You know, the, the handwriting kind of, uh, interest and phenomena has really exploded, especially in the last four or five years. I think with the rise of Instagram, that's helped a lot with that. Um, at least I've noticed that being more of a thing now than it was um, even when I first got into fountain pens, you know, eight years ago. So I think that's, uh, you're in good company there. I think there's a lot of good resources out there and uh, you should capitalize on that. If you have the time and the interest, by all means, go knock yourself out. All right, I got a couple of ink questions this week. This question is from Newindomsky13 on Instagram. Favorite ink feature and why? Sheen, shimmer, shading? Uh, for me, shading, like hands down. That's been my biggest draw into ink. It's always been my biggest draw. It's crazy to me, like every now and then, not everybody, but I'll definitely get some people that they, they're like, I love fountain pens, but I absolutely hate this light and dark variation. I want my letters to just look completely and exactly the same. I want the coloring to be entirely consistent. And to me, I'm like, that makes it look like a rollerball. Like, why don't you like the shading? Like that's, that shading is something that you can really only get with fountain pens, um, which is so cool. Or dip pens, I guess you could get too. But like, that is one of the coolest features, I think, of using fountain pens is using really interesting ink colors and having that fluidity and the ability to see that shading. But hey, it's not for everybody. For me though, that was the biggest draw. The, the color selection and then just the shading, that's the biggest property of the ink that I love. Now, I do wanna give an honorable mention to water resistance because there are certain specific instances where I want water resistance, especially when I'm, you know, writing the dressing envelopes on the outside and you know, other times where I know I'm going to be writing something and I want it to, you know, be impermeable to water and stuff like that. But that's not everything. I think, uh, you know, just in general, when I'm talking about any given ink that I'm using, I really want the shading. And so that's my deal. Love me some shading. All right. This is from R. Mikovsky on Instagram. Best ink for writing letters to a deployed spouse. Specifically, I'm hoping for something that's a little unusual, but still very readable. Archival, archival would be nice too. Um, so my personal favorite is a story I've shared a couple of times here on Q&A um, about a couple that wrote to each other using Blue Ghost, which is the Noodler's um, invisible ink that is UV reactive. Now, I don't know if you would consider that to be very readable or not. It's kind of the opposite of that, I suppose. But it's really cool because if you two know that you're the only ones that are writing those letters that way, it's really kind of cool and personal and meaningful. The only thing I would say 
is you probably wouldn't want to write the entire letter just in Blue Ghost because then it would look like a blank piece of paper and somebody might throw it away if they open it on your behalf, uh, well-intentioned, and uh, think that this is a blank piece of paper and then you might never get the letter. So you may want to just write a regular message in New Looks Black or just something, you know, kind of conventional looking, but then you can know that there's a secret message for you in Blue Ghost. Um, that said, I think it would be kind of cool um, to maybe consider something that is, you know, permanent or water resistant. Blue Ghost is uh, a bulletproof ink, but um, go with something permanent or water resistant. So that's kind of where I would start looking because you never know what that letter is going to go through by the time it gets back and forth from you. Uh, and you want that letter to stick around for a long time too, because, you know, just, you know, think about your, your grandkids, you know, years from now, being able to read those letters is really cool. So you want something that's going to stick around and last for a while. Um, so I think Noodlers has a really good selection of these. And the thing about Noodlers, I'm going to just give you a couple suggestions here because Noodlers has actually some kind of military themed inks, which are also water resistant that I think are pretty cool. So just a few of them that I kind of pulled through and found interest in. Um, Noodler's Lexington Gray, I think is one. It's a dark gray kind of color and actually has a decent amount of shading in it too, which finding a shading gray that has any water resistance to it is pretty rare anyway. So I really like that ink just for itself. But it's got a big battleship on the front and everything, so it's kind of cool. Uh, sorry, maybe it's the aircraft carrier. But um, the uh, Noodler's Air Corps Blue Black is another one, nice color. Noodler's 54th Massachusetts, and it's going back a little bit in time. But um, yeah, there's some good ones there. So if you just go on GooliePens.com and you switch water resistance as a feature on there, you can select by brand, you know, if you want to just select Noodler's, but you can see um, all the different water resistant inks, and I think you can find some really nice ones in there. Um, aside from that theme, you know, I think you could pretty much go with, with whatever strikes your interest. But I thought that was kind of a neat neat little vibe to be writing in a kind of a military themed ink as you're writing letters to somebody who's deployed. All right, hopefully that helps you out. And by the way, thank you for your service as well to both of you, because even the one who's not deployed overseas, you are still supporting our, our military. So thank you, both of you. I appreciate that very much. All right, um, I got a troubleshooting question and then a business question to finish us out. Troubleshooting question, this is from uh, Chris F. that came through an email. With my general clumsiness and lack of fine motor skills, I always seem to drop my beloved fountain pens. They plummet to the earth, nib down every time. What recourse do I have for damaging nibs in this way? Do you recommend different strategies? For example, repairing versus replacement for different nib types like steel versus gold. And how does one repair nibs? Okay, um, ouch, sorry to hear, sorry to hear this. Uh, that's kind of a bummer. I mean, this happens. I personally, like, I guess I'm just not a clumsy person because I've, I've literally never damaged a nib by dropping it. Knock on wood, right? Uh, I've never damaged a nib by dropping a nib down. If many thousands of pens as I've probably handled uh, in my eight years so far, I have not yet dropped one and damaged the nib. I have dropped pens before. I've just been fortunate and they haven't hit the nib. That said, I'm going to pick up my Namiki this afternoon and drop it straight on the thing. You just watch. Anyway, um, so I think that uh, if you know that you are uh, nib, nib uh, damage inclined, <laughs> Uh, maybe you want to maybe lean towards pens that uh, will accommodate your special <laughs> needs here. Um, so maybe go with pens that have, um, I, would, I would say probably stick more with steel nibs over gold just because steel is a harder metal. Um, if you're truly just dropping it like from six feet and it's going straight down on the nib, it's going to get damaged no matter what kind of nib it is. But, you know, hey, you might get lucky and it'll kind of hit at a certain angle. And, you know, the steel nib might, is a little bit stronger than the gold. So maybe you'll just get lucky and it won't quite damage it as much. So um, maybe lean a little more towards steel also because steel nibs are a lot cheaper. So you're going to be out less depending on what it is. Um, so that's just that's a personal thing. You can take that for what it is if you really want to take it that much into consideration. Um, but you can also look into pens that have swappable nibs. You know, for example, Lamy, you can buy a spare nib for 1350 or whatever it is in your area. Um, and you can put it back on the pen and then you're only out that much money. You know, having, having to send it to somebody and wait eight weeks to have it repaired if they're backlogged and, and deal with all that rigmarole. Um, you will want to do that if you have a more expensive pen, something with a gold nib and stuff like that. Then you're going to send out the pen. It's going to be gone for who knows how long. Um, but most of the nibmeisters that I've seen can repair just about some of the craziest things you've ever seen. Um, you know, I, I, there's a few that are more difficult to repair. For example, if you drop it and it literally like snaps one of the tines off the pen, 
that can get a little tricky. Um, but if it's just a matter of, yeah, it's kind of mangled, they can usually straighten it out, and you would never know the difference, usually. They're usually pretty good. I don't know what you'll expect to pay for something like that. I would say probably somewhere in the $50 range with shipping as a factor in there somewhere. could throw it $10 or $15 one way or the other. Um, but just kind of be aware of that. So if you're buying a pen, it's a $50 pen, you drop it on its nib, to get it repaired, it's probably gonna be easier just for you to buy a new pen or see if you can swap a nib and, and get it uh, done that way. Um, that might be the best best way to handle it. Or it might be that you can get a warranty service and maybe, maybe the, the manufacturer can put a new nib on it for less money rather than having it that actual original nib repaired. That's gonna depend on what's going on. If it's a steel nib, that might be the case. If it's a gold nib, it's probably still gonna be cheaper to actually repair it. Um, but uh, you know, exactly how it's repaired, I don't 100% know, because I haven't had any type of formal nib training in terms of nib repair. I've done some like basic, you know, uh, tuning and stuff like that, and a little bit of grind, but nothing, I've never done like any nib repair type stuff. Um, it's still a bit mysterious to me when I see pictures of like completely mangled up nibs, and then the Nib Meister puts a picture and it's all straightened out. I'm like, wow, that's impressive. I know it's a lot of work. I know there's like burnishing tools and various pliers and various things like that, hammers and, like there's some some pretty interesting techniques that are used to fix some of that stuff that would probably scare you if you were seeing the process happen, um, but when you're dealing with a mangled nib, you know you have to you have to do some pretty aggressive things to unmangle it. Um, so I don't know the exact method. And it would depend a lot depending on what it is, um, but I will say that generally speaking, unless it's just a simple misalignment, if you're actually dealing with like a crunched in nib or twisted or something like that. It's probably going to be uh, outside of most everyone's wheelhouse, unless you've had kind of specific training doing so, um, just because it's going to be easy, really easy to get it wrong. Um, but you know, if you've got a pen and it's just you know it's a mangled up steel nib and you want to try because you know it's going to cost more to get it repaired than it would be to get a new one, you can go ahead and try to repair it yourself. What's the harm? Um, but I can't give you any specific advice about how to actually do it. All right, and then uh, last question I have for this week is a business question. This is from Logan Teague on Instagram. What do you do with the empty bottles left over from taking ink samples, and do you recycle or do something else? Um, so yeah, we definitely use a lot of ink bottles. <laughs> um, you would think, you would, you would like to think, well, you can just contact your manufacturers and they can send you larger bottles and you know not have to use the original bottle. Well, yeah, not necessarily. 550 or 60 different colors. I can't even keep track depending on what week it is. Um, so we have well in excess of 500 different ink colors and keeping in mind that um, not all of them, you know, when you break them down into samples, not all of them fly off the shelves. Um, you know, we end up with a whole slew of different ink colors where it might only be, you know, uh, every few months where we would sell a bottle's worth. So to get larger bottles, and, and manufacturers don't regularly make larger bottles, and it's just, there's really no efficient way to get larger bottles. So we, what happens, in, especially with some of the more popular colors, is we end up with a lot of extra little bottles that are just the straight up, you know, bottles. They're just empty. Um, so first thing we do is like, well, let's try to, um, you know, have them be usable. Let's reuse them, right? Um, if possible. So we offer them for sale on our site. So for a pretty inexpensive price, it really essentially it's just the cost of our labor of going through and inventorying them and pulling and packing and shipping them. You know, that's kind of what you're paying for. We're not really making any money off of offering that. It's just, we'd rather not throw it away if we don't have to. So if we can offer it to you, there's usually, we don't clean them out so you can get a little bit of ink left in there and you can kind of test out a color of some random thing. So you, you know, it's not a, us uh, a truly usable amount of ink, but you can at least swab it up and you can see like, oh, this is an interesting, you know, but then you get the bottle. So that's kind of cool. Um, so you can uh, do that. Uh, if, if we end up with, you know, there's definitely some colors where, you know, I'll use diamine as an example. There's so many different colors diamine. And yeah, people will buy the bottles, but you know, they're not buying them at the same rate as we're producing them as we're making them available uh, for spare bottles. So we end up with extras. Um, so yes, whenever we can, we will either try to reuse them internally. We've had we've had some of our team before that has you know, been getting married and so they've taken a bunch of bottles and used them as centerpieces. I'm not joking. This has happened a couple of different times actually, but they've used them as little centerpieces and had flowers coming out of little bottles and stuff. I think it's a cool idea. 
Uh, Rachel and I probably would have done something like that if we had been in fountain pens back when we got married. Uh, but anyway, so I've seen that, or we just give them out to people to use for whatever reason, um, or we'll recycle them uh, then. And if for some crazy reason we're not able to recycle them, uh, we'll throw them out. But we haven't, we haven't thrown out bottles in a really long time just because um, uh, it was harder to do before we actually had a recycling, like uh, we have a separate recycling bin here. Like we have a large dumpster for our trash. Then we also have a special dumpster, which we pay extra for to be able to recycle um, stuff. So now we are just recycle all of our extra bottles and trying to help the environment out where we can, but yeah, we'll do it. All right. Um, and that pretty much answers it for this week. That's the end of the question. How about that? Um, I do need to randomly come up with a question of the week because I normally try to prepare that ahead of time. And for some reason, I just didn't. I think I was tired last night and I just didn't quite make it to the finish line in my Q&A prep. So I'm just gonna have to make something up off the top of my head. And that question is gonna be, where is the most interesting place that you've ever taken a fountain pen? That's what I'm gonna go with. Uh, for me personally, I really haven't gone a lot of super interesting places. I don't even have a good answer to my own question. So I'm gonna have to cop out on my own question because I can't even think of anything super interesting. I haven't gone, I haven't ever liked hike Mount Everest or done anything really cool like that. Um, you know, just like my in-law's house. <laughs> <coughs> Not terribly interesting. Um, you know, just traveling to certain vendors and stuff like that. Um, you know, maybe like the inside of like the Pilot USA uh, warehouse was pretty cool. And you know, being able to take pens in there, I don't know. Where is this the most interesting place you've taken your fountain pen? Have you gone like spelunking in Nicaragua or something and taken a pen in there? It'd be kind of cool to hear some stories like that. I don't have an interesting story like that to share, but if you do, that'd be sweet to hear. So go ahead and leave that in the comments. You can leave any questions that you have for me for next week. That would be sweet. And then any of the products that I talked about here that you're interested in, I talked about a lot of things I don't carry today, like, like ultrasonic cleaners, but um, if I talked about anything I, I do carry on my site, you go check it out on GoodlayPens.com and subscribe if you have not already. Thanks so much for watching and right on.